Good morning and welcome to St. John's McGuanago's Morning Praise. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Hasten to save me, O God. O Lord, come quickly to help me. The Spirit of the Lord fills the world. Let us worship him. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in his hand. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hand formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. This week we have walked through chapters 1, 2, and 3 of St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and today we'll discuss chapter 4. St. Paul's thesis statement for this letter is that we are saved by grace alone, and that we are God's workmanship, that he has prepared good deeds in advance for us to accomplish. In chapters 2 and chapters 3, we talked about how there is a dividing line between Gentiles and Jewish people within the Christian church. But that wall of hostility has been broken down by Jesus Christ who fulfilled the law in our place. We're all in the same boat, children of wrath, but we are also all children of God, adopted into the family of God and made citizens of his heavenly kingdom. In chapter 4, then, he gets a little bit more personal, not just with the church and how it's going to function, but also about us personally, we who are now saved, we who are now a part of this kingdom, without the burden of the law, without that barrier of hostility. And he wants us to live our lives worthy of this call, worthy of the gospel. It's as if St. Paul is saying, this is who you are now. This is how you act, to put away all of those selfish desires, to put away the old life. Remember, he's talking to Gentiles here, those who had maybe given over themselves to the sensual, to the ways of this world. He says, you're not that anymore. And notice he's not saying, oh, you're going to get better, although that may, may occur. What he is saying is, you're dead to that life. You're alive in Christ now. It's not about progress, it's about a death and a resurrection. And that is an everyday thing for us. We who are baptized into Christ, and St. Paul says there's one baptism here, he talks about all of these baptismal themes that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, that we have been put on a new clothing of Christ's righteousness. That baptism for us is a daily thing. We die to our sinful desires, and we are made alive in Christ. And in that, we are worthy of the gospel. We carry out these good deeds that he created in advance for us to accomplish. We die to ourselves, and we live for others. Within the church, St. Paul continues that idea of unity, that there is neither Jew nor Gentile in the church, but there is one Lord, there's one baptism, there is one spirit, there is one Father, there is one one church, sinners made righteous in the blood of Christ. And so within the church, there is going to be those who are called to be apostles. There's going to be those who are pastors who teach and who evangelize. There is one message because there is one Lord, one baptism, and one spirit. And the head of this church is the one who ascended after he descended. And so St. Paul talks about in chapter 4, St. Paul, about Jesus Christ, excuse me, who ascended into heaven is ruling all things. And the same Lord who ascends and rules in majesty and glory right now is the one who descended, who was born a baby in Bethlehem, and the one who suffered death in our place. He is the one who calls ministers of the gospel. He is the one who makes us one. He is ultimately the one who baptizes us into this family of God and gives us the full rights of citizenship of heaven. And since it's one Lord, 
and the church should act in unity with oneness. He also talks about what we might call spiritual growth. We got to be careful here because spiritual growth is not something that we should we should uh, uh, possess over that we should we should think about all the time and obsess. It is something that we look back upon. He says, eventually you have to stop being infants. So remember, he's talking to Gentile Christians for the most part, and they are new to the faith. This is all new. The, the world looks different now that they know about Jesus Christ. And he says, but you're infants in the faith, but eventually you have to mature. Now, it's not like they say, okay, now I'm going to mature. Now I need to take these steps and then I will become mature. Spiritual growth is always something we look back upon and we see that God did grow us. He did put us into positions where we did mature. And so the encouragement right now for the Ephesian congregations and for us, really, is that we continue in the Word of God. It is that we continue to think. It is that we continue to grow, not for the sake of growth itself, but that we become one with Christ. That we find this sphere, remember that theme of in Christo, in Christ, that we're pulled into this circle where Jesus Christ is our be all and our end all, the one who created all things, the one who gives us hope, the one who gives us life. There's a couple other themes in chapter 4. He talks about light versus darkness. And he's specifically talking about those Gentile Christians. You lived in darkness, but now you are enlightened. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. He enlightens us. You can think about going into a, a dark room where you can't see anything. And then the lights go on and your eyes are not used to it. And you're almost blinded by this light. But then slowly you figure out what's going on and you see the surroundings of the room. Well, this is true of law and gospel. We're blinded by the law, and we start to see ourselves, and it's not a pretty picture. And so a part of the enlightenment that the Holy Spirit gives us is that we see us ourselves as what we really are. But we also are enlightened to see the gospel, that there is hope, that there is more than hope, that there is the security in Christ who makes us righteous. And so why would we want to live in the darkness again? Why would we want to be ignorant again? Why would we purposely turn the lights off so that we do not see our sin and our Savior? It is people who live in darkness, who ignore the truth, who go by their sensual desires, who are led into untruth. But it is those who see, who are enlightened, who see the truth, we are people of the light, and so we should not turn the lights back off and go back to our old ways, as St. Paul says to those Ephesian Gentiles. You are people of the light now. This is who you are, and it's a beautiful thing. In the last part of chapter 4, he talks about the old self and the new creation. Once again, we're right back with baptism. And it's the same basic analogy as light and darkness, but with the concept of an old self and a new creation. If you go back to darkness, if you purposely ignore the truth and go back to this idea that you can just follow your sensual desires and, your, and the ways of this world, you are putting back on the old self, the one that is akin to the being a child, a child of wrath. It is to follow your sinful desires. But that old self is dead now and dies continually every time we repent of our sins and are forgiven. The new creation is put on. It's the righteousness of Christ. It is who you are. So here's the gospel at the end of this section. It's not about so much you striving to become a better person and fighting and, and trying to become mature. It is rather a death and a resurrection. And we look back and we say, yeah, Christ killed us in our sins and resurrected us in a new creation, and he did it every day. And along the way, yeah, we did grow. But the action is Christ. He's the one who does it. Does it. And so rest assured, dear Christians, that it's going to be okay. That this spiritual battle that you fight between old and new, it's waged by Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, 
who has given you this one baptism, this one church and the foundation of the apostles' teaching. He'll get you where he needs to get you. Don't worry about that. This is the gospel. Jesus Christ has saved us, and he will work through us. It's going to be okay. We are in the hands of Jesus Christ. The Te Deum. We praise you, O God. We acclaim you as Lord. All creation worships you, Father everlasting. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim, sing in endless praise. Holy, 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 Lord God of heavenly hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you. Father of majesty unbounded, your glorious, true, and only Son, and the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you humbled yourself to be born of a virgin. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You sit at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that you will come to be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, our heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power, and grant that this day we neither fall into sin, nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.